Today, we're going to learn how to morph between any two objects within geometry nodes. We're going to start off with the most basic version of this, and we're going to slowly customize it to make it more versatile such that you can add in any objects and it'll still work seamlessly with them. So I highly recommend staying till the end so that you can understand the logic behind how you can modify this to make it super versatile. And that way you can use the same logic in your own animations as well. So with that, let's begin the tutorial. In our default scene, we can go ahead and add in the different objects that we want to morph between. So we'll keep the cube as our geometry node object and just label this as geo node object and then we'll add in two other objects so maybe i can add in a taurus and suzanne because that seems like the most common combination so the taurus is here and then i press shift a mesh suzanne and then i can press gx and bring it here i don't actually need to see these so i'll just hide them over here after which i'll select my original cube and then bring my cursor to the junction of these two windows click and drag to create a new window and change it from the 3d viewport to the geometry node editor then i'll press the plus button to create a new geometry node tree after which i'll zoom in select the group input and just move it to the side by pressing G and drag it. Now essentially this group input is going to provide all the necessary points that we have. So instead of using a group input, I'll press shift A and search for a points node. And for the count, I'll use the maximum number of points present between the two objects. So actually I can tap X to delete it and then take this geometry and plug it into the group output. Next, I'll bring my cursor to the outliner window and just select the torus and drag it and drop it in. And then I'll also select Suzanne and drag it and drop it in. Now I want their original positions itself. Of course, if you made changes to the size and location and you want the changed location to come into effect you can always change this from original to relative but again that's completely your personal preference so maybe i'll change both of these to relative and i'll just unhide these and move them to other locations so right now they're here so i'll just press gx and move the suzanne here and take this gx and bring the torus here then i'll hide them again and i'll select the geometry node object now let's say i want these two meshes to be converted into a bunch of points that form the mesh for that i can simply distribute a bunch of points on surface so i'll search for a distribute points on faces node and i'll plug the geometry into the mesh now i have to do this for the other one as well so press shift d and bring it down here and take the geometry and plug it into the mesh now i want there to be a lot of density just to take a look at this i'll just plug this into the group output and i see clearly there's not enough points so i'll increase the density to something like 1000 and that seems to be good enough but i think a value of 200 will be enough for this tutorial of course you can always crank this up really high so even for suzanne i'll just plug this into the group output and i'll take a look at what it looks like and start playing around with the density till I get something that I'm happy with. So I think a density of 100 is giving the same density as the torus object. So I'll keep it at something around that much. The numbers don't have to match. Next, these points are stored as point clouds. If you hover over it, you can see how many points there are. So right now, Suzanne has 1,822 points, whereas the torus has to be plugged into the group output for it to be calculated. So let's plug that in and just hover over the points. And you see it has 1,958 points. So clearly the number of points are not the same, but we need at least 1958 points which is the maximum of these two to be present in this points that were originally creating so let's find the maximum by searching for a domain size so let's press shift and search for domain size and plug that in here as well as one down here now we don't want a mesh we want a point cloud so we convert this to point cloud and we do the same thing for the one down here and we check for which one is maximum so we press shift and search for a math node and we change this from add to maximum and that way we can plug this in here and this in here and now we have the maximum of two sockets this is what we can plug into the count of the points and now we can plug this into the group output now we have whatever the maximum is going right into the group output and that many points are present right here at the center but we need to now position them in the correct place so we press shift a and search for a set position node and essentially this position is what we have to deal with so we now need to figure out what is the position of every single point in the torus and every single point in suzanne so to figure that out we can press shift a and search for a sample index node and take this points value and plug it into the geometry and remember we need to find the position so we have to change this from float to vector because the position is a vector and we want it for every single point and we need to find it for every single index so we press shift a and search for an index node and that will iterate through every single index now if you want to see me do a very similar setup for curves so that you can morph between any two curves definitely check out this video that's linked right here it will also be linked in the description because that also is a very powerful technique however now that we have this position value we can directly plug this into the position of the set position but we see no difference and that's because in the sample index node we haven't actually sampled the position we haven't told what it wants to sample so we press shift a and search for a position node and that way the sample index is going to sample the position at every index and that position is going to be 
fed in to every single one of the points that were created over here. And that way we now have the torus. Now we need the exact same setup for the Suzanne as well. So let's take this, press shift D, bring it down here. This time for the geometry input, we take the distribute points on faces that was connected from the Suzanne, plug that into the geometry. And now if we take this value and plug it into the position, we get Suzanne. However, we see there are a few extra points that didn't get mapped anywhere. So we're going to have to figure out a way to delete those points. So we'll go through that step by step. For now, we'll just let it be over here and we'll focus on the transition. So to actually get a transition between these two, we need to mix it. So we'll shift this even further to the side, press shift A and search for a mix node. Now remember, we're mixing the positions and positions are vectors. So we change this from float to vector and then plug this first vector into socket A, which is the positions for all of the torus points and this vector into vector B, which is the position of every point in Suzanne. Now this result is what can go into the position of the set position. Now, if we have a factor of zero, it's going to be the torus. And if we switch it to a factor of one, it's going to be Suzanne. Now, I also think that I want the torus to be rotated on the x-axis. So I'll just select the torus over here, unhide it, and then press RX90. And then again, hide it as well and select the GeoNode object. Now we have a good transition by playing around with the factor. But I don't think just the factor is good enough. I want there to be some noise to be added in, especially at the center, so that it's not like a straight line that goes through. So for that purpose, I'm going to use this offset node over here. So I'll press Shift A and search for a noise texture. And I'll press Shift A and search for a vector math node. Because remember, the noise texture is centered around 0 0.5. We want it to be centered around 0. So we plug the color into the vector and we change this from add to subtract. And we subtract a value of 0 0.5. Similarly, you could have added a value of minus 0 0.5 if you wished to do so. Now, after the subtract, the noise texture might be too small of an influence. So to increase the influence and also make sure that it goes back to 0, we press Shift A and search for another vector math node. And this time we change it from add to scale. So when we select scale, we now have a single value which will be multiplied on all three of the axes. So now we can take this vector and plug it into the offset of our set position. So now if we just scale this up by quite the amount, we see that it's just moving back. So we have to figure out what might have gone wrong because right now we are setting the position according to the torus as is. And then we're also offsetting it by some amount of noise. So if you think about it, the noise texture is actually giving us noise added in to the original position. So if you look at the color socket over here, it says the color field is based on the position attribute from geometry. Now that means we are taking the position of these points, but the position of these points are all zero because they're present right at the center. So that's why it doesn't work. So in order to fix that, what we could do is actually instead of using this points, if we had directly taken any of these geometries and done the same thing. So let's just plug this into the geometry. You can clearly see how the scale is actually adding in proper amount of noise. So you can have a scale of zero with no noise, or you can just start adding in noise like this. But since we don't want to do that and we want to use this points itself, what we can do is we can play around with the position of these points that is being sent into the noise texture by playing around with this vector node over here. So what we do is we search for any node. So let's go with a random value node and plug this into the vector. Now I don't want it to be on one single axis scaled on all three of the axes. So I'll change this from float to vector and change the mins to minus one and the max to plus one. And then if I plug this into the vector, we get the same amount of noise that can be controlled with this scale slider. So that seems good enough. So that way we now have the randomization aspect. Now, essentially, I want this scale to be keyframed during the transition. So now let's first animate the simplest transition. So we'll change the end frame to 150 so that it's just a five second long animation. We'll also switch the frame rate from 24 frames per second to 30 frames per second. And now on frame one, we'll just hover over this mix value over here and tap I. Then we'll go to frame 150 and change this factor all the way to one and we'll tap I. So now for the scale of the noise texture on frame zero, we can have the scale down at zero. And then by around frame 50, we can change this scale to something really high. Let's go with five and then we'll tap I and then we'll keep it at this high value itself till frame 100. And then we'll tap I while hovering over the scale pocket. And then at frame 150, we'll change it back down to zero, hover over it and tap I. In case the first one wasn't registered over here, make sure that you change the scale back down to zero and then tap I. So now when you play the animation, you should get this smooth transition between that circle to this particular Suzanne. Now during this entire middle region, I feel like the points do not have enough motion in the noise. So I'll change the noise from 3D to 4D. And for the W, I'll just add in a driver. So I say hash frame by maybe 400. And that should just keep adding in some noise even while it moves around. If you feel like even more noise is required, you can change this from by 400 to something even greater. But I think this is good enough for now. Now, remember, the frame rate is going to be slightly slower. So if you want to see it happen at real time, you can change this from playback of sync every frame to frame dropping. And that way, you'll get a realistic idea of the speed between which it's going to transition from one side to the other. So this looks good enough, but we'll start dealing with the nuances now. The first thing is there are these extra points that just get stored over here. 
how do we get rid of the extra point? For that, we press Shift A and search for a delete geometry and plug that in over here. Now we need to delete not all the points, but only the points that are extra. So how do we find out the points that are extra? We press Shift A and search for an index node and we need to check if the value of the index is greater than the number of points that is present at a minimum of these two domain sizes. So we press Shift A and search for a compare node and we are comparing if the index is greater than the minimum of these two nodes. So we need to find the minimum of these two nodes. So I press Shift A and search for another math node. And this time, instead of add and changing it to maximum, we're going to change it to minimum. Then we can plug this point count into the first socket and this one into the second socket. And whatever the minimum is, we can compare the index with that. And then we can plug this result into the selection. So now a single point seems to still remain. And that's because we need to change this from greater than to greater than or equal. And that's because the indices start from zero. So that way we get rid of the points. Now that might look fair enough after you watch the transition. But if you actually come back right to the start, you see that the torus is now missing a few points and that doesn't look good. So we have to make sure that these values are deleted only after the transition begins. So for that, I'm not going to directly delete all the points that are greater than this value. But instead, I'm going to slowly bring this value down from the maximum to this value over a range of frames in the middle. So I have to mix this value with the maximum value. So I press shift A and search for a mix node and I plug that in over here and I'm going to keep it at float itself because the minimum and maximum are float values. So now I can plug this maximum into the second socket. And now if I go all the way to a factor of one, we have all the particles present. If we change the factor down to zero, we have only the minimum number of particles present. So since we start adding in noise at frame 50, I think at frame 50 will also start the transition of the factor. So remember the factor should initially be a value of one so that all of these points are present. So let's go to frame 50 and then just hover over this factor and tap I to add in a keyframe. You can select the node so that you see the keyframe down here. And then by frame 100, let's delete all of the extra points. So let's change this factor down to zero and then tap I and then just select these two keyframes and tap T linear. And that way you should get a smooth deleting of these points and it won't be noticeable. So now if we just play the animation, you see how we get the transition between these two different objects. But this is not the end of the tutorial. And that's because right now we are always considering that we're going from an object that has more number of points to an object that has less number of points. What if the object that we are going to has more number of points? So for that, let's see. Since we're shifting to the Suzanne and Suzanne had lesser number of points, which is 1882, whereas the Taurus had 1958, what we can do is we can just increase the density for Suzanne. Let's change this to 250. And now you see the setup that we did no longer works. Suzanne is missing a bunch of points here and there because they are now deleting points later on. So we have to figure out how we can control this factor to not just go from one to zero every single time, but be based on which one has more number of points. So for that, we can actually press shift A and search for a value node and use this value node to control the factor. So let's actually add in keyframes to this value node according to what they were on this mix node. So that means we go to frame 50 and change this factor all the way to one. So let's give it a value of one and tap I and then we'll go to frame 100, change this back to zero and then tap I, select this particular node, come down here, press T linear. So now if we plug this value into the factor, we ideally should get the same thing. But what we're going to do is we're also going to press shift A and search for a math node and change this to subtract. And we're going to subtract one minus whatever this value is. So let's plug this into the second socket. And now if you think about it, whenever the value is one, the output from here is zero. And as we slowly transition from one to zero on the value node, we're going to transition from a value of zero to one on this particular output. So now we need to switch between these two outputs based on which of these two objects have more number of points. So essentially, if this one is greater than this one, then we have to use this value directly. Or if this one is greater than this one, we have to use this value directly into the factor. Or it might be the other way around, but we'll just take a look at that later on instead of thinking about it. So for now, we'll press shift A and search for a switch node so that we can switch between two different values. So let's plug this in and we don't want to switch between geometries, we want to switch between float values. So we can choose float from this drop down. Now we can plug this into the first socket and this into the second socket. And this output is what we can plug into the factor of the mix node. Hopefully all of this is making sense. Maybe I should make this even larger so that all of you can see this better. But essentially, this is now the setup. So we have a switch node as well that is allowing us to switch between going from one to zero or going from zero to one. So hopefully that makes sense. But we need to actually control the switch. So we need to decide when it uses this value 
value and when it uses that value. And as I already mentioned, we're going to be doing that based on whether or not this value is greater than this value. So to compare those, we press shift and search for a compare node. And now we'll plug this point count into the first socket and this one into the second socket. And we're checking if it's greater than we plug this into the result. That way it'll switch accordingly. Now let's see what's happening. So we bring this back down, bring this up by a bit and let's just watch. So right now we have extra points present at the start. So this is not what we want. So let's change this from greater than to less than. And now you see there are no extra points present. As we shift over to the side, there are no extra points present here either. And we have the entire Suzanne mesh, which means points are getting deleted correctly. And this is the entire effect. The best part about this is that it's highly customizable. That is, we can change these objects whenever we want to any other object as well. So we can just press shift A and search for maybe an icosphere. And now I can select the geonode object and then take this icosphere from the outliner and just drag and drop it into the geometry node workspace. Let's just bring this up a bit. And now I can take this geometry and plug it into the mesh and all of it will work just as well. So there's absolutely nothing that you have to worry about because everything just ends up working out. So essentially the last thing that you are left with doing is just setting the material and instancing some points because right now if you switch off overlays and go to your rendered view, you won't see anything in EV. If you're on cycles, you will, but in EV you won't. So you press shift A and search for an instance on points node, plug that in right after the set position, just before the group output. And for the instance, you can choose whatever you want. In my case, I'll just go with an icosphere with subdivision set to two and a radius of 0 0.05. And I can plug this into the instance value. And then I can press shift A and search for a set shade smooth node, plug that in over here. And and then press shift a search for a set material node plug that in as well for the material i can just choose the default material because i'm not using that for anything else then i'll go to my world properties change the background color all the way to white i'll also switch my viewport shading to rendered so that i can see what i'm doing i'll select the default light and press delete to remove it then i'll select the geometry node object again go to the materials down here for the material i'll just change the base color to a slightly darker color maybe keep it at a bluish color i'll switch off overlay so that i can see what i'm doing and i'll also place my camera so let's just select the camera from here press alt g to clear location alt r to clear rotation then RX 90 to rotate it on the X axis by 90 degrees and then press GY to move it back and then you can press zero to go into your camera view. Then you can just make adjustments to its position till you're happy with what you get and you can watch how the transition happens and it moves from one object to the other. Now you can always increase the number of points by increasing the density and then changing the radius of these points to make them even smaller so that they are much finer and you can always give these different materials and just play around with these however you want and that way you can just create various animations that look like this. I I really hope you learned something from this particular tutorial. Understanding this type of thought process and workflow will help you create your own animations and it'll help you build the foundational tool sets required to figure out how you can make different effects whenever you need to do the same. So with that, if you've watched so far, thank you so much for watching. The watch time really helps me. And until the next video comes out, check out all the different videos on my channel. And as you do so, keep creating and stay creative.